So when I got out of the service, the divorce happened. Um, she got everything. A combination of there was no more, uh, there, there was nothing more for Gary Lewis. for Gary Lewis and the Playboys because of the louder music, the crazier music, the heavier 70s, very, very hard rock. And I didn't want to stay in music and do what was happening just for the sake of staying in it. Brought to you by the many fine products of General Foods. Hi, I'm Tom Cottle. I suppose some of us are interested in him because, after all, by the time he was 18 and 19, he was a fabulous musical success. And maybe some of us are interested in him because he is, after all, the son of a show business giant. I think most of us are interested in him simply because he is the man, Mr. Gary Lewis. And I am delighted to meet you, Gary Lewis. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I just got, I, I remind all of us, I've got them written down, this diamond ring, what an amazing success. Three and a half months, number one record. <clears throat> yep. Before the age of 19. Right. Count me in. Save your heart for me. Everybody loves a clown. She's just my style. Sure gonna miss her. Green grass and on and on and on. Five gold records, sir? Mm -hmm. Five gold records. Right. First five, yeah. Gary, look at this. Do you recognize this guy here? Um, this guy looks just about like I do now. Get out of here. <laughs> That's you at what, that, 18? That, that was 18. That was uh, on the very first Dick Clark uh, Where the Action Is tour. Uh, they called it Caravan of Stars back then. Right. And it was 10 acts. Uh, all get on the bus and go do six weeks of one-nighters all over the country. And it was, it was fantastic experience. Tremendous fun. Does it seem like it's part of your life or almost part of another life? You know what I mean? The music and, and travel. That, that, that 18 and 19 year old business, that's... Well, it, it, success came very, very fast. And it was the first thing that I ever went out to do on my own and did achieve success at an early age. Um, at 17, it was Yeah, happening. yeah, and it was awfully early. It was very early. I had to have proper management, therefore it was my mother because I was a minor. Um, various help from my mom as far as uh, financing this diamond ring saying I'll give you the money now now if something doesn't happen and it doesn't go on the charts don't you dare let your father know you know don't this kind of thing you know to because mm -hmm. she was making the investment you know so right when diamond ring went to number one I said dad look at this gold record here terrific you know we made it and everything was cool so that was the very beginning of it and I was still going to college down in uh, Pasadena Playhouse here in Los Angeles doing Things like Othello, Oedipus Rex, Dancing in the Tights, a little bit on stage, and uh, it just wasn't for me. So when this all clicked, I said, see ya, I'm going on the road. Gary, we take a break at this point, but when I come back, I want to start talking about some of the pressures and experiences that you had. There Exper were none of them. Experience with drugs, mm -hmm. some, some very low times. Oh, yes. Okay, and indeed some ulcers at a very early age. Mm -hmm. Back then in a moment with more, Mr. Gary Lewis. In 19, there are ulcers. You're struggling with something. A draft. Drugs. I want to hear about, I want to hear about those experiences. Where do we begin? Well, going I guess, into the Army, do you think? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. That, that was the very beginning of it. Going uh, into the Army, being drafted, and coming off of uh, five gold records in a row, and all of a sudden, you know, I get the letter that says, you will come with me now. You're the top of America, and you've got to go in the Army like all the other kids. got to go in the Army, and everybody's saying... Hey, make it work for you like Elvis. Sing, sing for the troops, do this. I was mad. I was mad that the career was nipped, you know, right after five gold records. So they said, do you want to sing in the service? I said, no, absolutely not. You just put me somewhere. Um, but, but going over in the army and then uh, being transferred from Vietnam to Korea, uh, created uh, the entire thing of uh, going through a divorce at the time, also. Wait a minute, does help step up? Step up. You got well, married. You got, <laughs> got, got married in basic training. Yeah. So when I went overseas. And had a baby. And had a baby. Um, I was separated from them. They lived in the Philippine Islands because that's where I met her mother. Right. My daughter's mother. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
And uh, Daughter who's now about 15, 16? 15, right. Yeah. So we were separated all the time. So when I got out of the service, the divorce happened. Um, she got everything. A combination of there was no more... Uh, there, there was nothing more for Gary Lewis. There was no more market for Gary Lewis and the Playboys because of the louder music, the crazier music, the heavier 70s, very, very hard rock. And I didn't want to stay in music and do what was happening just for the sake of staying in it. So you really came home to an almost to nothing. Nothing. No family, no wife, a child in the Philippine Islands. Gary house, Lewis and house is family. gone. The house, she, ta she takes this all? She got it all. Now, uh, which leads me up to the the uh, the, the pill situation. Uh, before you get into the pill situation, I'd like to know: Were there any difficult experiences in the army? The army is for many people a difficult experiences. But you are in Vietnam. You said to me earlier for uh -huh. three months right. in Korea during a Pueblo incident right. time. Are there tough experiences for you? Do you see combat? Do you see death, Gary? Do you have these horrible experiences that men and women come home with? I'm very happy that, that I, didn't, I didn't have to see a lot of death, but I was always around it, and I was always hearing gunfire and bombs, and things just went on like normal, mortar shells 100 yards away. You know, I just kept typing. Type up your form, you know, do it. Do what I had to do. That's what I was doing. A clerk typist yeah. right there in Saigon for a little while, then over to Korea, and that's what I did over there too. Because I, I heard from somewhere a story that a friend of yours was killed practically on top of you. True, apocryphal, false, scary, what? Yeah, 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 that's true. He was a guy I graduated uh, high school with, and I didn't actually see it happen, but I saw him laying right there, just, just walking along the trail, and boom, I looked to my left, and there he is. There he is, just there he is, and that's, that was the end of it. I, whew, I couldn't believe it. Where was this? Vietnam, right outside of Saigon. And he's just lying there? Just lying there, dead. People are walking, carts of fruit, the oxen, you know, nobody's picking them up, nobody pays any attention. What'd you do? I cried. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I did, you know, what can you do? When did, the, when did the drug stuff start? Right when all that crazy mental stuff started happening, you know, like people being killed. And the ideas of people being tortured and stuff like this. And just hearing stories from my friends where they can't sleep at night because every little noise, they're always jumping. They, they, they sleep with their rifle. Um, so anything to, anything to make the pain less. Now what's the pain? What is the pain? The, the pain is, is constant paranoia at all times, wondering if you're going to be shot, if you're going to be blown up by something. Uh, uh, there were empty beer cans laying out in the fields where guys would say, hey, I'm on American beer. They'd go pick it up, bam, blow them up, booby traps. You, you, you had no idea what any little piece of equipment was. It could have been booby trapped. You didn't know what to touch. You didn't know where to walk. Therefore, you're so paranoid about everything. Properly just, paranoid. You, for sure. And you just stay in one place and do whatever it takes to, so you can get by another day. Oh. And, and that's where uh, the drug thing came in. And drugs are readily available, I take it. Oh, geez. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a type of warfare. You know, North, North Vietnamese or North Korean infiltrators will come down, sell the American GIs bad, bad dope. Uh, not just dope, bad dope, so that they'll kill themselves. You know, was, uh, you know anything went. What drugs do you take? Towns. Towners? Yes. Name them. Sleeping. Second all, yeah. barbiturates. Right. Never anything with a needle or anything like that. You know, I, I don't know why. I just don't know why. It just never happened. But on a regular basis, Carrie. Regular basis to remain calm, stay calm, and then everybody's saying, "How are you going to shoot somebody if you're calm?" You know. But I, I, it, it was one of those things where you just couldn't help it. There was too much, too much anguish. You know, and uh, like a platoon of 20, 30 guys would go out, ten would come back. You know, you just know that this is what's happening. Ten come back. Okay, you're thinking, where are those 20? They're out there dead somewhere. Boom, a couple more pills. You know, you come back, I gather, from, uh, from Korea and Vietnam in really wretched shape. Yeah. Bad shape. Describe the shape, can you, Gary? Well, the, the shape was getting back into town. It was, uh, well, flying from uh, Seoul, Korea to Anchorage, Alaska, and then Anchorage to Seattle, Seattle to Los Angeles. My whole family met me there. Everything was great, wonderful, beautiful. Um, Mom and Dad they didn't know the airport? About, yeah. yeah. They didn't know about the problems. They didn't know about drugs or anything like that. So right when I got an apartment, that's, um, 
uh, realizing there was no more market for Gary Lewis and Playboys, went around to Liberty Records, my old label. Uh, there was no interest anymore. Wow. Um, and so then I, I just kept on with, with the pills until I landed in the hospital. And doctor just said one day, all right, this is it. Plain and simple. If you continue this, you will die. And I went, oh, okay. Now, you didn't go, oh, okay. What did you do? In my mind, that's what I did. Yeah. You know, I just listened to him. Now your parents are recognizing that there's a real problem here, no? Yes. Well, there's no problem now. No, 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 at the time. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sure. You know, my mom would call me and say, have you been drinking? I said, yeah, yeah, I drank some wine, you know, or something like this. She, she always busted me. My mom knew. She knew. And um, uh, she, was, she was doing the best to keep it from my dad, you know, because uh, he, he had... He, he's always got so much on his mind and stuff, and I sure didn't want to add anything to it. But he was upset later on that, that I didn't come to him with the problem for any kind of help. He was upset that I didn't trust him enough to go to him. Let's take a break. Uh, when we resume, I want to ask you a little bit about that man who is your father. Okay. From the son's point of view. Sure. Okay, I'm back in a moment then with Mr. Gary Lewis. We're back. I'm Tom Cottle speaking with Gary Lewis. Gary Lewis of the Playboys. Gary, uh, I, I, I warned you, I'd talk a little bit about you and your dad and your mom, whatever your family. This, it was one question, though, that I did want to get clarified. Mm -hmm. During this period when you're in a difficult drug situation, there's a marriage mm -hmm. and a divorce. Right. And right after, yet another marriage and a divorce. Mm -hmm. And right after that, your present marriage. Is nope. that correct? One more and another divorce. How many marriages mm -hmm. altogether? This is four. This is four. I'm on the fourth now. Right. And um, this is it. I mean, I definitely believe that this is it. The fourth time, uh, it's, it's actually the first time I've really been in love. The other three times were due to either convenience or, uh, uh, or taking advantage of the person, you know, not being proud of the way I was, but it just wasn't real love, you know. Tell so, me what convenience means. Convenience, I w uh, the second marriage, um, I was having trouble after I got out of the Army, didn't have too much money because the first wife got all that. She had your parents' money. Why? Well, I, I had my parents' money. Yeah. It's their money. They don't help their son? Ah, well, that's a whole different thing. Oh. That, we'll get it, will we get into that, sir? If you'd like I to. I would like to, yes. But uh, the second marriage was convenient because uh, she had a terrific job and um, had a place to live and stuff like this. You know, now... Why do you have to marry her? Drugs. Drugs. Why, was Drugs that? will do that to you. It'll make you do stuff that, you're, that, that you wake up the next day, just like going out and getting smashed drunk one night, and you wake up and you, you look over and go, what? Who's that? You know. It's the woman you married when you weren't even well, conscious of it? it exactly. Uh -huh. This kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. A bad way, weren't you? I was terrible. I was just terrible. But there's another marriage after you get off the drugs. Mm -hmm. Why her? Right. Well, I uh, <laughs> had gone to school with her for 17 years. Uh, all the way through junior high, high school, college, uh, theater arts college, and this and that. And it was one of those things where it, it seemed very, very right at the time. Your mom likes her, I know. Yeah. See, yeah. Know. See all this stuff enters into a, a little deal like that. Well, your mom liking her, was that the kiss of death or was that the kiss of life? Who knows? Uh, you know, I, I try to figure out what's within me, you know, uh, whether or not I want to make myself happy or whether or not I want to do things to make people that love me happy. Might that have been the reason for the third marriage? I, I think so. I think so, you know. My mother had seen me go, on th go through all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and finally, when I uh, married my third wife, she uh, appeared to be the type that could take the reins, you know, take hold of me and, and put me back right and stuff like that. And I figured that's what my mom wanted. So it wasn't what you I wanted? wanted. To, no, but I, I had to try to redeem myself with my, with my folks. That's what I thought. I thought that I had to... Were they down on you at this point? Oh, yeah. What is wrong with our first son? That's right. He's just... Something is just terribly wrong, you know. And later on, my dad blamed it on himself. He said it was all his fault. Well, let's, let's back up now. In the course of the minutes I've talked to you, there's been a couple of references to your dad. First of all, your mom becomes your business manager and don't tell dad. Second of all, the business on the drugs. You mentioned, notice how I'm listening to mm -hmm. you. Here. Oh, yeah. I'm taking yeah. a note. Yeah, no. and, the and the second, you are <laughs> and, the se <laughs> and the second mention is, you know, I'm not, I didn't want to tell my father. I didn't want to burden. He had a lot on his mind. And in your mind, your drug problem 
was going to inconvenience him. He had things on his mind more important than the fact that he had a son who was an addict. That, that's what I thought. Why? Why were you afraid to go to him? Just for what you said right there. It couldn't have been anything more than being afraid of him. You were afraid of him? Oh, sure. What were you afraid of? Oh, he was the most tremendous disciplinarian while we were growing up. I mean, I mean heavy duty disciplinarian, you what's, know. What's heavy duty mean? Uh, good old fashioned wallops. Real good ones, you know. Now see, even though I was 21 years old and going through all these problems and everything, I was afraid to go to him because I, I, I thought that he would probably just say, hey, you got yourself into it, get out of it. You know, now that's, I'm sure, another reason too. Good old fashioned wallops. Oh yeah. Not in the face, in the whatever, Not spankings. Very, very rarely in the face, you know, just, you know, good old man to man stuff. I'm not gonna say he ever hit me. Never, never close fist in the face or well, nothing. No, no. But what's know, just what's man to man oh, stuff? Oh, come here. <laughs> you know, you know. At what age? Oh. Up until what age? Teens. As long as I can remember. You know, up until about maybe 25. You know, now, now I'm not saying that he was mean. No, I'm not hearing that. Or anything like that. But but I think that he thinks that a father's job is never done regardless of how old the kid is if he's got something to lay on me some some important bit of advice on life or whatever it is age means nothing if it if it takes a little physical shaking up to get the point across to me he would do it but you were afraid yeah well, oh yes i was afraid in your eyes did your dad love you i always thought so and he always told me um w when we were younger uh he'd make it a point to come in even if the lights were out to, to our rooms, give us a kiss goodnight. He'd say, there's nothing wrong with, with men kissing, you know, stuff like this. I want to give you a kiss goodnight. I love you, my son, you know. Why didn't you go to them for money when you were struggling? Hmm. You weren't asking for $500 million. <laughs> yeah, right. You were asking for a little support. Exactly. Why didn't you ask? Well, Mom see, or and, Dad. And answering that question right there would, would be putting... That'd be putting them down. I don't want to put them down. I don't either. Can you answer in some way that it doesn't put them down? I was cut off. <laughs> Does that put them down at all? That puts you out. See, that, it, it was, that's the way it was. I was just cut off, period. What does that mean? You're leading, you're leading the life of, of a person who's taking drugs and you're drinking too much and, and we don't like what's happening with your life, so that's it. Boom. You want to come back in the fold, you clean up your act. Absolutely. When they told you that, I rebelled more, got more upset, and took more drugs. This was early 70s. Mom and Dad are taking this position together. Now, who knows who talked who into... Doesn't make a difference. Yeah, right. I'd like to know, though. Oh, I was just going to say that <laughs> Gary Lewis would love to know just whose idea was that. But you know, one of the thoughts that I have about this is, some point in that period of your history, you might have thought, Mom, how could you have done this? In the past, I might have been afraid to ask him, but have you deceived me now? Aren't you on my side, my former business manager, my friend? Where are you, Mom, I going thought, along with this decision? I thought that. I definitely thought that, because every time we wanted to, myself or my brothers wanted to ask for anything, it was always to Mother, because we knew Mother was cool, everything was fine, Mom was great, don't worry about a thing, you know? Um, and then... Uh, I mean, which she was, everything was okay, but, but it really wasn't that way. It all came from Dad, because uh, she would then in turn go to him to find out if it was cool, but, but we always went to Mom. And now we were couldn't. always afraid to go to Dad. Now, now I, 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 don't know, I don't know why that is. I, I, I still, to this day, don't know why there was always such a tremendous fear of my Dad, because he never beat us up or locked us in closets or stuff like this but there was a certain there was a certain fear there that that kept me and my brothers a lot from asking him things confronting him what is the worst thing i asked this of a son what is the worst thing then that happened to you what is the worst thing that can happen to you what is the worst answer you can get in my situation it was no and that meant I was reaching out screaming for some love, uh, some support, some help somewhere, you know? And they're saying... But I wasn't putting it in the right words, maybe. And they were saying... No. We don't love you in this moment. Well, they didn't say that. Is that what you took it to mean, though, mm -hmm. Gary? 
Yeah, that's, I did. That's all I'm asking. Right. Thanks for your openness and your candor. Back, and I'm speaking with Gary Lewis. Gary, quick, quick, quick questions, quick answers. Okay. You are, of course, no longer cut off from your parents. No. That's, it's all together. Everything's fine. Okay. Things and are okay. Not, we were talking during the break. You mm -hmm. want to say something about your folks? Say it. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something to you, too. What I was going to say is that um, uh, anything that, I, that I've said here is, was, n was not meant at all towards, uh, I mean, as far as a jab towards my mom or my dad or anything like that. I just want them to know I'd like them to know how I feel, and it's a lot easier doing it, doing it this way than sitting them both right down and saying, all right, now this is what's happening right here, because, you know, you, you can't think of it all, you know, so I hope he sees this, my folks see this, and, and maybe they get a little insight to me better or something. I hope so. Don't let anybody hurt you anymore, Gary Lewis. No, no. Okay. <laughs> Take care, and thank you. Thank you for joining Gary Lewis and me. I will see you the next time. Thanks, Gary. I, I, I was really a pleasure. Promotional consideration has been paid for by the following. While in Los Angeles, the Tom Cottle Show is videotaped at the...